I, I just started reading a book about um, like a knight in the 18th or the 8th century. It's, yeah, I don't, it's oh, a knight with a K. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yesterday in the emergency department, I was with I was with my preceptor and we were in room one, which is the the holy of holies in our emergency department. It's the biggest room and it has everything you could ever need in there. Oh, I was just going to say ER nurses are just kind of superstitious too. So, <laughs> And um, it's for when like 10 different people need to do 10 different things at the same time to the patient. Like if they're that sick. Right, 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 right. Anyway, so I'm in there with my preceptor and we're both trying to, you know, save this person and uh a gentleman Wait, like save them spiritually or <laughs> we were busy sharing the gospel oh uh, okay yeah no we were we were starting medications and trying to talk to doctors that kind of stuff cool cool and like this middle-aged gentleman in khakis and a tucked in like button shirt oh yeah opens the curtain into the room to look inside and we turn around and we're like hello and it's like i'm looking for room one but this guy has a sticker on his shirt he has one of the visitor stickers on his shirt oh. it says hello i'm a visitor so he has this giant sticker on his chest that says 55 oh <laughs> and so he says i'm looking for room one and all of us are super confused because he clearly should be looking for 55 not room one and so my preceptor was like Sir, this is room one, but it looks like you should be looking for 55. And the guy says, no, uh, they told me to look for room one. <laughs> and so Cody just walks up to him and shuts the curtain in his face and says, you have a sticker that says 55 on your chest, sir. And I thought that was the funniest thing. I felt bad because I laughed really loudly when he said that. So I'm pretty sure the guest <laughs> heard that. I'm sure it was a. Did he? It, it was a curtain. <laughs> did he know? <laughs> did he know he had a sticker that said fifty-five on his chest? You know, when you work in customer service, so <laughs> <laughs> all I was thinking about that whole story is I was like, if I did that on like a pediatric floor, I would I would definitely get fired. <laughs> Just <laughs> that's like only things you can do in the emergency room. What? Just tell somebody sarcastically about the sticker on their chest yeah to just like or maybe that's something you can only do with adults because if i did <laughs> that with like a pediatric patient's family or something like that i would probably oh. get in trouble but oh i see yeah but that's I crazy I, he was he was probably really confused probably someone gave him directions and he thought they were telling him just not just not cody Co <laughs> i mean well cody was he was trying to save this poor guy so <laughs> yes. Um, Priorities, I guess. <laughs> no, that's actually really funny. <laughs> Poor guy. Mm. So, I'm David. Oh, I'm Matthew. And this is the handoff report. And there's still no cure for male pattern baldness. It's also raining outside, which is <laughs> it's pretty nice. In the wind, do, do you get um? Oh, the uh, seasonal affect disorder. Do I get sad? I get. I mean, I get sad sometimes. I don't know. Like sometimes, if it's been cloudy for like a week straight, yeah, that'll I get to me. I feel like I'll be sadder than normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I I do get sad. Anyway, so we're uh, we're talking about um, RSV, which yes. is um, a respiratory. Sensitial. There it is. Virus. <laughs> RSV. So this is something that's come up a lot uh, recently. Um, and it's mostly affecting kids. Mm -hmm. It's not really treated in, uh, in adults at all. Just because it's generally not as severe. Um, but when it hits kids, like it hits them harder and more severely. And like they have to be hospitalized. Something to, that I remember... It that I had to keep in mind about pediatric patients is that everything is smaller or shorter. Mm -hmm. So their respiratory tracts are much shorter. So the bacteria do not have to work as hard or travel as far to get to places like their ears, their sinuses, their throats, right, right. their, and in this, in this particular case, their lungs. 
Yeah. And I mean, you also have to think, especially in like the younger kids. So like under one years old, they're also like less developed. Mm, yeah. Like lung wise. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, they're uh, like their space they have in their lungs for transfer between oxygen uh, to the blood and carbon dioxide from the blood um, is a lot less. So like if something were to happen, it generally wouldn't take a whole lot for it to be bad. Do you get these patients, Matthew? Uh, yes, too many of them. <laughs> like how many? How many of them? Like how big is your unit, for example? Um, how many beds? Uh, we have uh, twenty-four. And how many of them do you think have RSV in a oh, given shoot. day? In a given day, um, like taking averages in, probably like six, seven. So a whole third of them. Yeah, pretty wow. much. <clears throat> and we're a surgical floor. We have a floor dedicated to like mostly respiratory kids. So we're getting like kids on top of what they're getting. Oh, so there's probably more critical ones on a different floor. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess so. I don't know. I don't know if you're if they if they came from some kind of ICU or something, or if if maybe it's la- like laterally from one step down unit to another. Yeah, I think we get it mostly from ER. Oh, I see. From like children's ED, and we've even been having like kids who are sitting like in holding. There, yeah. so there'll be like there'll be like twenty kids, most of them with respiratory issues, just like waiting mm. to get to a floor. And a lot of times, well, sometimes they're having to discharge them straight from the ED <laughs> after treating them for like two or three days. Wow! So it's a respiratory disease mm-hmm. in the middle of summertime. <laughs> yes. So if you think that doesn't make any sense, where a lot of times, like in a normal year, we'll have RSV kids in winter, right? And that's just normal. It gets colder. That's when, like, your colds. That's when people um, are indoors. Pneumonia. Yeah, that's when things tend to happen. But kind of the common theory around, like, why it's so bad right now is because um, no one's seen each other in, like, 18 months. Ah. So, like, daycares are opening up. Kids are seeing one another again. And then they're all getting, like, all these diseases that, like, otherwise their immune systems would have been healthy enough or like developed enough to take care of that's really neat because i remember kind of researching this that it's most common from like six months to one and a half years Mm -hmm. and that's exactly how long we've been in quarantine kids born during the shutdown oh yeah it's it's these kids yeah it's these kids that are getting rsv right now that's kind of interesting Mm -hmm. huh so, so there are upper respiratory diseases, yes. such as what, oh, epiglottitis, whatever. And lower respiratory tracts means um, now you've made it, I think, past the trachea. Yeah, just think of it, you're, you're going into the tree branches, yes. so, to, so to speak. <laughs> right, because your, your airway is like an upside down broccoli. It, <laughs> it's, it, the stem of the broccoli is your trachea, and then it'll spread out into, Bronchus, into smaller bronchioles. and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller airways. There are diseases that affect the bigger ones, but this one affects the ones like closer to the end. So think of it as like, think of it as like a cold or pneumonia. Those will be the symptoms. Yeah. Is this is this like a particularly lethal virus? <clears throat> um, it can be. So mm-hmm. to like to give you an example, we have kids who are like three, four months old mm-hmm. um, who are on like 11 liters of high flow. Oh, my. Which is oxygen, which is a lot. And that's just to keep them satting like decently well. Mm-hmm. Um, so kind of why this is so dangerous is one, because it gets bad enough where they're not able to like adequately perfuse their body. But also they stop eating and drinking as well. Oh, so because they can't catch their breath and eat, Mm -hmm. they could panic while they're eating and aspirate. I mean, the main reason why they're in the hospital is one for oxygen, two for fluid. Okay. Like rehydration? Yeah, because they'll come in and the parents will be like, they haven't eaten in like four days. So when Mm. you think about kids and kids who are like three to four months old and they haven't had anything, any sort of fluid. Nutrient management is really delicate in mm-hmm. those years um and if they're if they're dehydrated that young like that could potentially be causing problems as well so those are the main reasons why they're there 
like symptomology, like how they present. A lot of times you'll see like the classic, I can't get oxygen ones mm -hmm. where they're not sat, like they're satting in the 80s. It'll, it'll be kind of like a flu-like presentation. So they could have... Um, Do they shiver? Um, not necessarily. They have fevers. Okay. Um, so they'll be, they'll like throw a fever in. They'll like be really congested. If you listen to them, they sound like very, very coarse. Oh, um, wheezing. And sometimes they'll have wheezing. And then a lot of times you'll do an x-ray and they'll find like it might have developed to uh, pneumonia. I would like bet my house that they, <laughs> they have bronchiolitis as well. Yeah. So I guess the same way COVID causes a viral pneumonia. Yeah. RSV causes viral bronchiolitis. Yes. Because the it's extremely contagious from coughing, sneezing, and touching. Oh, yeah. It's a contact so droplet. It's a contact droplet, meaning these kids are covered in their saliva and boogers already. <laughs> uh, you don't... They don't have to, like cough it on you if you touch them you know it'll be on them yes especially around their faces and hands so all it has to do is travel down your respiratory tract and it's a short distance and then it lands in your bronchioles one of the smaller passages in your airway and that'll inflame them because when you have itis at the end of the word that always means inflammation, inflammation. so bronchiolitis is what's going to make them wheeze. Inflamed tissue usually secretes fluid, so it'll make them wheezy, but with like very wet lung sounds. And so management of this virus has to do with making sure they get oxygen, but also seeing if we can open up that airway. So that's where respiratory therapy comes in as well. So a lot of the interventions we can do are on our own and the parents can do, mm -hmm. um, is like bulb suction, which I'm not like a huge fan of. No, I that's, mean that's, it works. That's for, but... Bulb suction's like a, isn't it like a turkey baster? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but for a, a, an infant's mouth, we've all seen or it. Or nose, we use it. Oh, that's right, their if, nose, especially if they're on high flow. But that's not going to clear their lung secretion. Exactly. So like, that's kind of the thing where they have to cough it up far enough where we could actually get to it with the bulb suction. But a lot of times you're just getting like the boogers in the front, which is not really helpful, yeah. except it just makes them, I don't know, maybe it makes the parents feel a little better. For me, what I like to do is um, do like suction with saline. So you oh. just like squirt saline in one nostril and then like intermittent suction on the other one and it pulls it right out of their, their like nasal passages, which is nice because that's... Where they cough it all up, you know, so it just sits in there and can create a mucus plug, um, like in their sinuses. Okay. So you just, you just kind of go to town a little bit huh. and, and you can pull a lot of like those really like thick secretions out. That's really the, interesting. Yeah. It's, 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 it's very satisfying huh. to, to do. It really is. Um, so you, you did like nasal dialysis then. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And it's, yeah, because it's nice because what that does for the for the kid, like it clears it up. So what I like to do is if for especially, we call them juicy. If the kids are really juicy, <laughs> you can do that before they try feeding them. And that helps them uh, like get the food down better. In the ER, juicy only means that they have good veins. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so... <laughs> So when we're trying to feed them, um, a lot of times what they'll do is uh, they'll like put them on fluids for a while until they feel they're at a point where they could take formula or whatever they're if they're taking uh, their mother's breast milk. OK, um, but a lot of them, they I think they just switch them over to formula. Like there's a couple ways you can do it. You can start them out by feeding them just straight Pedialyte. Okay. Which is just like, it's... Um, pediatric Gatorade. Exactly. A non-flavored pediatric Gatorade or mm -hmm. flavored, I guess, if you want to mix it up. So that's like a, it's a lot thinner mm -hmm. than normal formula. So it generally goes down a lot easier. So the baby, if you think about a baby who's trying to like swallow something thicker, it takes a lot more effort on their part, mm. um, which in turn takes a lot more oxygen. Right. So it takes away from their ability to breathe. 
Mm. So they'll start out with something really thin and see how they do on that. And then they say, oh, okay, they, they did great. They took three ounces of that. So they took like 90 mLs of Pedialyte. So let's move them on and we can do half Pedialyte and half formula. Mm. So they thin out the formula and then they feed that until they feel like they're at a point. And all this time you're trying to taper down oxygen and then bring them back up to full feeding. Hmm. So then eventually you go to full, um, full formula. So basically you just like cut it. Okay. That sounds like, um, like a nutrition rehab, if you will. Yeah. Where they came in not wanting to eat, but you're getting them to a point where they don't need you in order to feed anymore. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, the things we like to see them going home. These are kind of like the boxes we check. Sorry, I'm going to turn on the air conditioning. It is getting a little hot in here. (laughs) Keep going. Um, So the things we we like to look at um, before they're ready to discharge is we want them to be completely off oxygen. So what we usually do is we take them from high flow. So high flow just means there's, uh, it's like pushing more oxygen at you. So uh, think of it as like more pressure. So it's like a high pressure of huh. oxygen. Well, does that pressure, is the pressure there to like, like a balloon help inflate the lungs? Uh, yes. Yeah. So it keeps the, the alveoli open. Oh, okay. Um, so it's kind of like, think of it, if you're on a ventilator, they have certain settings that, that um, control how much pressure is getting pushed into the lungs. And that's to, to inflate keep, them. Exactly. Yeah. And to keep yeah. the alveoli open and not collapse. Yeah. So it's kind of the same thing with high flow because, I mean, if we can help it, we you never want to put a kid on a ventilator. Yeah. Because that requires sedation, intubation, and then eventually like ventilator weaning. And there's and a high risk of injury. Injury and also that they'll never get off the ventilator, especially if they're that young. Um, mm, like development stops and everything. Exactly. Yeah. So if we can help it, we don't want to put a kid on a ventilator. So that's why we use like a high flow nasal cannula. So they can still with the nasal cannula, they can still eat, they can still drink. So it's it's just one of those least uh, invasive interventions you want to try before. Um, So we want to get them off high flow nasal cannula to the wall nasal cannula. And then we start tapering down, 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 down. So you'll go to um, like three liters. And then maybe we'll try two, then one, and then half, then a quarter, and then completely off. So I had a kid the other day who was sitting at a half a liter nasal cannula for two days. (laughs) Wow. And I was trying to wean him off, wean him off, wean him off, wean him off. I got to quarter, and then I got him off, and then he dipped to like the 80s, so I put him back on a quarter. And then I had to keep him there the rest of the day because he kept dipping. And then he was was on a a quarter for the whole night. Hmm. Cause he kept dipping and then that morning i finally got him at like five o'clock i got like i got him down in the morning to 0.5 again because he went back up to half a liter and then i finally got him off at like 5 p.m so wow. like wow it, it just takes it just however takes, long it takes yeah. and the, a good thing about that is the doctor came and listened to uh the patient and was like he kind of sounds wheezy yeah it and sounds to like, me hmm. like it's not a there must have the treatment should have been more aggressive in in a certain area like we're you're almost at the finish line but not doing an extra right. push and i was talking i'm like i feel like he just needs like something to get him over the like a steroid see that's what i thought was a steroid and this is something i learned the the doctor she she said well we actually think it's a bacterial pneumonia oh. and not a viral pneumonia which means if we treat it with steroids it the, it could mean the bacteria could potentially grow and make the pneumonia worse. So instead of steroids, let's try an albuterol treatment. I steroids. love this doctor now. You do? Yeah, I'm a huge fan. That's of it. A, yeah, that sounds like a big brain, a big brain consideration. Let's let's stop for a second and kind of explain a couple of things. So steroids, and when we talk about COVID, we'll talk about this too. Um, steroids are not talked about that much in nursing school. But when you get into the hospital, you realize steroids are like the first line drugs of reducing inflammation in Mm -hmm. the body, especially corticosteroids. They end in the suffix zone. Prednisone. Yeah. So there's prednisone, there's methylprednisolone. They end in own like that. Um, (laughs) Dexamethasone. Yeah, that's it. So uh, I think dexamethasone is the one I've seen. 
usually used for respiratory inflammation if they have to take a pill for it. I've seen them take um, methylprednisone. I've seen with pills. Okay, yeah. So or it's, IV. As long as it's the same type of steroid. So Matthew and I both were thinking along the same line where um, maybe the issue was we needed to open up that airway more in order for this child to receive more oxygen. Fun fact: you also give these steroids in premature babies for lung development. Mm-hmm. Like these steroids are great for and especially in this started, age group it starts with a b right the one that what what is that oh man i'm pretty sure it's beta methasone yeah that's it beta. i'm not a NICU nurse so i don't i'm not either but I, <laughs> at least i paid attention in school <laughs> i'm kidding you always got higher grades than me i want to just make that clear that wasn't always true but <laughs> um beta methasone okay beta methasone is given in mother g- given to mothers for the baby's lungs to develop. Also, after the baby's born, sometimes they'll keep pumping them exactly. with it. Yeah. Because um, for some reason, steroids steroids reduce inflammation, but they also like catalyze different things, uh, different hormone productions. It's some it's a very production. yeah. It's a different. It's a very like multifaceted class of drugs. But um, something it's good for is respiratory development. So in kids. We, you know, Matthew and I were thinking, hey, let's open up that airway with a steroid. I didn't know that if you, if someone has like a bacterial infection, steroids could make it worse. So think of it like steroids as, I actually, I was playing, um, I was playing Warzone. <laughs> <laughs> this is why this makes sense. Okay. So think of it as a steroid is like dropping, like a supply drop. Okay. And it's full of a bunch of weapons. Okay. Oh, okay. So you're dropping the supply drop. If it's bacteria, bacteria are able to use those weapons. Oh. So you're giving the wrong things the energy or the things they need to become even more powerful. Oh, so it's like uh, it's like the Iran nuclear deal. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're giving you're giving like the things you don't want. So the things you're fighting. Exactly, that ran nuclear deal. Yeah, let's just drop a bunch of cash on the doorstep of the terrorists. But but viruses, like, they don't need the energy to reproduce, right? No. They can do that apart from energy. So they don't even even utilize it. Yeah. Because they just hijack your cells to to reproduce for themselves. Which is really, that's some, like, doomsday stuff right there. If viruses ever, like... Viruses are spooky. They're like gain sentience, and that's something that'll keep you up at night. Um, but I don't think they do the things they do unless they are sentient. Like they're. But to like what extent are they sentient? Mm. You know, is it just like this biological need to reproduce, or are they making conscious decisions and saying, "I'm going to go invade that cell and completely hijack its its cell structure." To reproduce myself. I just feel like if something is capable of making something personal. This would make a great Black Mirror episode. <laughs> <laughs> but but I feel like the viruses just take it to a personal level. Huh. Where they're like, I'm going to use your own body against you. And there's yeah. nothing you can do to stop me. It's personal. <laughs> it's the other way. Like, it's not business. It's just personal. Hmm. Anyway, I feel like we got way off track there. Got deep that was, into the I, rabbit trail. I think that was a good pit stop to take because that's yes. an important issue that virus rights. Yeah, so <laughs> virus rights. <laughs> Shoot, what was I even talking about? Okay, no, 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 no. Oh, we were we were explaining why steroids, steroids. would have made sense. So right. I was because I was gonna ask you, um, like we're talking a lot about oxygen therapy. Yes. But uh, what kind of medications are they given to open up that airway? We said steroids, which yeah. makes sense in in like in like in, certain in, contexts. If it steroids is would make indeed sense. RSV, because if you, yeah. well, if you think about the types of uh, medical issue or medical problems that steroids are used, it's like asthma. Asthma, yeah. Is and right like now, the big one. right now it's being used in COVID. In too. COVID, so viral. It's by... inf- inflammatory airway diseases. Right. Yeah. So it would make sense that you'd use it in something like RSV. It's used in COPD yeah. for that reason, too. But the only reason why you wouldn't use it in this instance is because it was bacterial mm. and could potentially make the bacteria worse. 
Um, so that was an interesting little like tidbit to learn. Yeah. Uh, that was cool. So instead, she says, well, he like he sounds a little wheezy. So let's try an albuterol treatment. Albuterol? Okay. Albuterol. Albuterol, it's the rescue inhaler used in asthmatics. Right, so it's used in asthma. And what it does is... Um, what it does is it binds to the receptors in smooth muscle. Yes. Depending on where it lands, it communicates different things. Um, there are drugs that bind to the these what are called beta receptors. They bind to your heart and can tell it to you know beat faster or beat slower. Yes. But in albuterol, its um, its primary purpose is to bind to the smooth muscle that wraps wrapped around your airway uh-huh it binds to that and tells it to relax so in <laughs> chill <laughs> calm down <laughs> so when that's how rescue inhalers work when you have asthma you're like <gasps> you take the rescue inhaler and it opens up those airways by relaxing the smooth muscle and then you're suddenly like be- clearly able to breathe again think about like smooth muscle like behaving in asthma, like someone who's like really uptight. Yeah. And at the smallest little thing that goes wrong, they just like Yeah, they get up. tense. And then the albuterol is like a Snickers bar. It just... <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like that, <laughs> that text from the boyfriend that says, you need to calm down. It just makes everything better. I'm pretty sure that text from a boyfriend... <laughs> it just calms everything down and everything's okay, right? I don't think that's how that works. I don't think it's ever worked ever to tell Probably a girlfriend not. to just, just calm down. Just, I don't, you need to chill, okay? I don't remember a time where that ever helped the situation. <sighs> no. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's what it does. So, um, and I should explain the kind of the connection between wheezy and like a tightening of the airways. So when, when, uh, when airways tighten, think of it like whistling. Oh, so yeah. you close, you know, you close your lips and you make a little like, mm-hmm. and it's the air getting pushed through a small opening and that's what makes the wheeze. So think of it's the same thing in, uh, in your airways. So if it closes up, there's less space for the air to move through. So it makes a little wheeze sound. Don't, mm. I don't know how to explain why it makes the wheeze sound, but oh, it does. Oh, I do. Oh, yeah, go for um, it. You're the musician. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of cool. It has to do with um, the pressure of the air going through is just enough to vibrate the airway enough to produce a sound. So, Interesting. so a trumpet makes its noise. You can breathe through a trumpet and it sounds like, <sighs> but, um, when you blow a raspberry through a trumpet, it vibrates the trumpet just enough and at the right frequency for it to produce a note. Interesting. So, um, you can, you can do this. You can do what the wheezing is doing um, if you take a paper towel roll and blow a raspberry through it. (laughs) Because the air isn't flowing smoothly through it anymore. It's flowing chaotically, which is what you do when you blow a raspberry. So that, that is the physics of wheezing. Congratulations. Here we go. Look at us. Expanding. Um, Yeah, so uh, they gave uh, an albuterol treatment. I walk in the room and I'm like, dang, this kid looks so much better. Mm. And like, it totally worked. And then like later that day, I I got the kid completely off oxygen, doing fine. So I was like, okay. All right. You learn something every day. So RSV has been known to infect adults at very, but it's kind of not even detectable because people will just feel under the weather for a couple of days. They probably won't even see anybody for it. It's super common to have it spread at schools and daycares, especially, not schools, but especially at daycares, pre-Ks, things that are in that age bracket. Well, it's like the things they don't tell you about little kids is they're kind of nasty. What do you mean they don't tell you? It's well, self-evident. I mean, it's like I mean, the love of God. It's self-evident. <laughs> well, like no one's, no one like outright says kids are kind of nasty. No. But like kids can be kind of nasty sometimes. So like the, you know, it's easy to spread something like this. That's like a droplet because kids are like sneezing in each other's faces and like putting their, their hands in each other's mouths. Oh, and right. Stuff. They're sucking on their thumb and then sharing toys. Yeah. So it's just like, yeah, that's why it spreads. So 
it's not necessarily like this horrible disease no. that's like incredibly um it is scary it is scary it's but like it's not scarier than anything else it's mm -hmm. just because the patient population it affects like don't really practice good like necessarily good hygiene yeah yeah and um oh last thing oh go for it um so w especially important with these kids is fluid volume I totally forgot about this. Oh, fluid volume? Fluid volume. I wouldn't think that fluid management would be a big deal with something like RSV. So here, this is kind of the interesting thing. Um, so with fluid volume, you know, they're not eating, they're not drinking. So if they get dehydrated, what does that do to the, to the secretions they're producing in their lungs and upper airways? Does that... So they have less fluid to start with, so are they... Are they like thicker secretions? They're like way thicker. It's like concentrated and syrupy instead of thinned out. Exactly. So if we pump them full of fluids and um, it thins the secretions out and makes it easier to clear. So it makes it easier for them to breathe. Hmm. Um, and then also we're, uh, we're looking for diaper counts to make sure they're peeing enough as well. And that's kind of how we measure whether or not they're like adequately uh, have enough fluid volume. So they've lost fluid because they've lost the desire to drink mm -hmm. or hydrate. And, you know, they're not hydrating through whatever food or formula they might be on. Are you managing the fluid with that pedalite you were talking about earlier? Or are you managing the fluid with, like, normal saline boluses? Uh, well, usually they're on some sort of, like, a continuous normal saline, like, just an IV. Oh, okay, like... Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I mean, we'll uh, we'll do like a like a weight based. Oh, weight based. That's true. In pediatrics, everything it, it's is all weight based. based. Kilograms gotcha. per milliliters per kilogram per hour. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So it's a uh, it it'll be specific to the baby. Yes. Yes. Oh, there is no vaccine. So here's the thing. Dang, this is another thing I forgot about. So there is no vaccine. But there kind of is a something you can give them. It's kind of a preventative. Vaccine. It's sort of a preventative thing. Hmm. So there is uh, like a shot you can give them. That's like an RSV shot. They barely ever give it. Huh. Only in like severe cases where the kid is, um, I guess, fits into some like special category where they'd give it. Oh, okay. Um, and it is like a preventative thing. So I, I believe. It's even if they've had it before, you can like give them the shot or mm -hmm. even if they currently have it and it's a way to um, like prevent them from getting it again what, or getting it again worse. What shot are they getting? Um, I would look up like RSV vaccine. Just, yeah, Synergist, that's it. Synergist? Yeah. Just one, just one preventative RSV shot called Synergist has been approved. The monthly vaccine from Swedish Orphan BioVitrum <laughs> can be used in high risk. That's the name of a company, not the name of a person. It can be used in high risk infants. So far, a broader protective vaccine has remained elusive. See, I told you they made it personal, but the pipeline is rich and seems to have hit overdrive in the past few weeks. And this was published two days ago. Huh, yeah. Wait, so that just didn't explain how it works. Moderna receives FDA fast track designation for RSV vi virus two days ago. Interesting. Oh, it's an mRNA virus, like a vaccine. Oh, shoot. That's interesting. Oh, so they, the, so the F, so, um, who's this Swedish dude? Oh, here, look up their website. Mr. Mr. Swedish Orphan Biovitrum. They're probably, um, here, look, Synergist's website. They're probably, Piggybacking off the technology used to develop the COVID vaccine, which is an mRNA vaccine, they're using that and seeing if they can make an RSV vaccine. Huh. What is Synergis? Synergis helps protect your high-risk baby from severe RSV. Um, how does it help? Synergis gives babies who are born prematurely the infection-fighting antibodies they lack, helping protect their vulnerable lungs. Synergis is not a vaccine. Children can still get severe RSV disease despite receiving Synergis. If your child has the an RSV, make sure they continue to get inject monthly injections. So it's just through the season. 
oh. the RSV season. So they get these monthly vaccines. It's like a supplement. Yeah, I saw like I, oh man, I think I've seen like one kid get it who hmm. was high risk. It's not really given out a whole lot. Children should not receive synergists if they have ever had a severe allergic reaction. Duh. <laughs> Since signs and symptoms, um, we all know they have rash, anaphylaxis. Interesting. Okay, but this is not what the FDA is fact track. What the FDA is fast tracking is research to develop an actual legit vaccine. Right, because there isn't a vaccine for it. All you have is this synergist thing right now. Hmm. That's neat. I had no idea this existed. Oh, yeah. I, I saw it the other day, I think. In the hospital? Yeah, this week they gave it wow. to some kid. So, yeah, premature babies or high risk, maybe immunocompromised. I don't know if you give vaccines to immunocompromised. It depends. This is, but again, this isn't a vaccine. This, this synergist. It's not a vaccine. It's synergist. It's synergist. <laughs> but yeah, so just uh, like any kids who have. Um, like pre-existing lung or heart mm -hmm. that makes some sort of a cut where they would qualify for this. Interesting. I think that's everything. I think that is everything. RSV. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't know 90% of this. No, I didn't either. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm David. I'm Matthew. And this is The Handoff Report. 